So first of all, uh, we don't have to be convinced to appreciate the importance of engaging uh, Roman Catholicism. It's a global issue wherever you go in the world, uh, north, south, east, west, the Catholic Church is there and has been there for a long time. Of course, the issue takes regional, national, cultural shades and colors, but uh, because of the very nature of Catholicism, which is different, but at the same time one, uh, it can be dealt with uh, as a whole. Uh, so it's a missiological issue because wherever we go in the world, we find um, ourselves involved in dealing at different levels with uh, the Catholic Church. It's a theological issue because uh, Roman Catholicism um, compels us to reflect upon the basics of the gospel, a basic historical understanding of uh, the history of the church and compels us to uh, reflect on what is essential, what is secondary, what is at stake with Catholicism as a whole. And for many of us also it is a pastoral issue because uh, in our churches, congregations and ministries we often deal with people with uh, Roman Catholic backgrounds or family members and so in one way or another uh, this issue comes to us uh, in different forms but basically uh, urging us to reflect upon what is really at stake. Let me begin by uh, offering you a brief uh, theological definition of um, Roman Catholicism taken as a whole. I know it's, I know it's a complex uh, issue and can be approached from different angles, different perspectives, different nuances, but this is a broad overall uh, introductory definition of what we can uh, say about Catholicism. And uh, Roman Catholicism, of course, I take full theological responsibility for this uh, definition. Uh, it, it won't be accepted by many observers, many uh, analysts and, 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 and thinkers, but that's, that's the way uh, I, I, I take it and I, the whole morning will be an attempt to uh, come back to this definition and to show degrees of consistencies, consistency um, related to the contents and the thrust of this definition. It is basically a deviation from biblical Christianity. It's not just a yet another form, neutral form, plausible form of Christianity, but it has fundamental flaws in terms of biblical Christianity. And our task is to see what is at stake in these deviations. Why have they have they have they have taken place, and what was at stake in them? taking place and what are the outcomes of these deviations, not in peripheral issues only, but in the, in the core elements of the Catholic understanding and practice of the gospel. It didn't come overnight, it didn't happen overnight, there is no a date birth, a birth date of Catholicism, it consolidated over the centuries and that is part of its complexity. There is no uh, birth date of Rome, Rome, the Roman Church, it is uh, the result of a long process over the centuries and this uh, calls us to apply historical awareness, historical research, historical analysis uh, <clears throat> when it comes to uh, addressing the topic of Catholicism. By clustering around an imperial Roman institution, the key aspect of the development of Catholicism is the association with the Roman Empire, gradually taking the Roman imperial uh, institutions, Roman imperial structures, the Roman imperial ideology, uh, absorbing it and making it central to its own self-identity. So it is, was a gradual process of uh, the church becoming more and more like a religious empire, taking the place, replacing uh, in, in many ways uh, the Roman Empire, no longer in only political terms but in religious, institutional, Christian terms. Uh, centering on its sacramental system, once the, um, 
the Roman scheme, the Roman uh, structure was assumed as the basic outlook of the Catholic Church, emphasis was given to the sacramental system with this, this newly founded or um, developed uh, religious institution. Um, and so Catholicism is largely defined by its reference to uh, its sacramental system forming the infrastructure, the theological infrastructure and the ecclesiastical institutional um, infrastructure of the system and grounding itself on its synergistic theology leading to an abnormal ecclesiology. Uh, Catholicism, Catholicism's main problem is that it, it has developed an abnormal inflated ecclesiology over against other uh, in core elements of the gospel taking the place of uh, supplementing and becoming a dominant feature of the Catholic self-understanding. It's an abnormal ecclesiology uh, grown out of the absorption of Roman imperial um, self-understandings and uh, becoming dominant in the overall system <coughs> um, promoted by the Catholic Church. So you have a strong, abnormal, inflated ecclesiology dominating the scene. And in this process, it has also absorbed uh, various pagan elements, making room for uh, practices, devotions um, uh, that were part of the uh, preceding religious landscape. And uh, with this uh, approach, with this imperial type of approach, as the Roman Empire was able to absorb um, other religions in terms of finding room for the new uh, religions of conquered peoples, uh, the imperial outlook of the Catholic Church made it possible for it to absorb elements that were not uh, peculiarly or particularly uh, integral or part of the uh, Judeo-Christian root of the Christian faith, but um, were added to that uh, mainstream Judeo-Christian um, uh, uh, religion and being fueled by its universal Catholic project of embracing the whole world. Again, another uh, um, uh, aspect absorbed by um, and from the Roman Empire was, was this imperial outlook, of course, matched with the uh, Christian language of mission to the whole world, but interspersed with this imperial political idea of dominion and embracement of the whole world uh, to be taken under the authority of the institutional church. So that is a definition that emphasizes uh, the process of the Catholic Church becoming something quite different from the uh, early patterns of biblical Christianity and uh, being elevated to the dominant features of Roman Catholic Christianity to the point of becoming um, what uh, the Catholic Church has been uh, promoting over the centuries. So Roman Catholicism retains significant theistic Christian elements. So this process of absorption uh, was not something that totally replaced uh, Christian elements. And so we have to appreciate the fact that significant theistic Christian elements are retained, like you know, the Trinity, for instance, the doctrine of the Trinity and, and uh, uh, Christian morality. Yet because of its blurred theological system, it departs from biblical Christianity at all points in different ways and degrees of intensity resulting in a confused and distorted religion uh, at the very core. So there is a sense in which the Trinity, the Christological outlook of the Christian faith, of course, was officially, formally retained, but because of elements that took place within the Catholic Church, while at the formal level, while at the um, official level, 
uh, the Trinitarian creed is professed, the Christological faith is taught, but at the same time, there are elements within the system that practically undermine the Trinitarian Christological framework of the Christian faith. Mariology, for instance, is just an example of what it means for the Catholic Church to be at the same time committed to the Trinitarian Christological faith, and yet having developed a whole stream of theological reflection and spirituality, spirituality leading away from Trinitarian and Christological uh, aspects of the Christian faith. Once you have a whole spirituality centered on Mary, that practically deviates from the um, uh, Nicene Creed and the Trinitarian pattern of the faith, whereby people are encouraged to pray to other sub-mediators and therefore undermining the fact that in Christ, the God-man, we have the only mediator that can lead us to the Father. And also, it implies the, a diminished role of the Spirit, whereby if we have to go to Mary or to the saints in order to approach God, not only we diminish the role of Christ as the mediator, we only diminish the role of the Spirit as being the link, the bond, leading us to the Son, the mediator who leads us to the Father. So formally, there are theistic Christian fundamental elements which are retained, but then practically there are elements that run contrary to that Trinitarian Christological Orthodox pattern. And the end result is that it is a mixed and distorted religion. And this, what it, this is part of what it makes Catholicism a complex topic to address because you can see it from different angles, but our attempt will be to try to look at it um, as a whole, as a system. Let me um, talk about a biblical pattern whereby we can uh, at least begin to see what is at stake with the Roman Catholic Gospel. You all know uh, the passage uh, by the Apostle Paul uh, in, the second in Second Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verses 12 to 22, where Paul uses the language um, according to which his preaching was not uh, based on an yes and no approach or response to the gospel. You remember the criticism that he had received by some circles within the Corinthian church, uh, criticizing his uh, having to change his mind over his missionary planning and therefore having to uh, change his uh, missionary itinerary. And the crit criticism went uh, f uh, further than just questioning the ability of the Apostle Paul to plan his own journey by undermining his apostolic authority. So the critics would say, look at this man, he is not able to plan his own journey. How is it possible that he is a reliable apostle? He is totally unreliable. He cannot plan his journey. His preaching was and is unreliable. Now, Paul, he understands that the, the criticism is not so much about his planning abilities. He will try to explain why he had to change his plans. But he understands that uh, the critics would actually want to undermine his apostolic credibility, the apostolic authority of his message. And therefore, he comes with this message, with this language, what I preached to you was not a yes and no at the same time, was not an ambivalent, was not an ambiguous, was not a partial in agreement, a partial agreement with the gospel. It was a full yes to the glory of God, a full yes in response to the person and work of, the, of, the, of, the, of Jesus Christ. And my message has always been a full, integral, radical, simple, clear yes. Now, this language helps us to understand what is at stake with Catholicism, at least as I, I understand it. There are elements of the Catholic Gospel which are both committed to 
yes and no elements to the gospel. There are elements which are retained and reflect the yes elements of the gospel, whereby the person and the work of Christ, the historical person of Christ and his work are affirmed. But at the same time, at the very fundamental level, there are no elements to the gospel, no responses to the gospel that make the synthesis, the Catholic synthesis, always a blurred answer, never a full yes, never a full no, but always a combination of yes and no elements to the gospel. There is, of course, the uh, confession of Orthodox Christology, but at the same time, the uh, pushing of non-Orthodox Christological trends by way of encouraging the veneration, the hyper-veneration of Mary, the veneration of the saints, and by way of uh, um, understanding the very nature of the, of the church as the prolongation of the incarnation of Christ in a sacramental mood. In this breaking away from the clear boundaries of the, the time of the incarnation, uh, the Catholic Church is both committed to Orthodox Christology, but also committed to a blurred Christology. And the same is true as far as the Trinity. Formally, it is affirmed. The doctrine of the Trinity is affirmed. But then practically, uh, for most Catholics, uh, what makes more sense for them is their relationship with Mary and the saints than with Jesus and the Spirit. And once you have this, coming out of the official teaching, coming as an outcome of what the Catholic Church believes and teaches, you have a problem in the system. It's not just an unexpected outcome. It is an integral, expected outcome for people not to have a Trinitarian-shaped uh, faith, but something that is quite different. The same is true as far as the commitment of the church to the Bible. There is a yes element. The Bible is read, the Bible is venerated, the Bible is uh, obeyed, but at the same time, there is a no element whereby the tradition of the church, the magisterium of the church, they are all voices uh, which determine the way in which the Bible is um, believed. And in very important aspects of Catholic theology, it is not the Bible informing and shaping Catholic teaching. It is more the traditions of the church and ultimately, ultimately the magisterium of the church. So it's not a yes or no, it's a yes and no at the same time. Um, when it comes to salvation, of course, there is the, the affirmation of the necessity of God's grace and the reliance on, on God's grace, but at the same time, there is this strong uh, emphasis on the fact that without approaching God's grace through the sacramental system and without performing good works, uh, God's grace in and of itself is not the sufficient ground for salvation, yes and no. Of course, there is uh, the, the worship of Christ and of God, the triune God, but at the same time, much of Catholic spirituality is shaped by other forms of veneration. So, uh, thoroughgoingly, we see this pattern going on at all the times and at very fundamental levels in every area of doctrine, in every area of spirituality. Yes and no. Now, we all grapple with this tension. I don't think there is any one of us who is fully committed to the yes elements of the gospel and can in conscience say that he or she is not uh, influenced by the temptation to um, also affirm the no elements to the gospel. We all struggle to be faithful. We all struggle to uh, purify our response to the gospel in order to make it more and more similar to a yes alone response. So I'm not saying that 
outside of the Catholic Church, we don't have this problem. We all have this problem. And we all have degrees of um, absorption of no elements. The problem with the Catholic Church is that because of its dogmatic outlook and its dogmatic commitments, uh, it is practically difficult, if not impossible, for the Church to change the overall synthesis. It's not a church committed to be always reforming in the sense of being serious about reforming very basic convictions and very basic teachings. Of course, the Catholic Church has a language of reform, of inner renewal, but not at the expense of breaking the dogmatic synthesis that makes the Catholic Church what it is by committing itself to dogmas like the two recent Marian dogmas, 1854, dogma of the Immaculate Conception of Mary, 1950, Marian dogma of the bodily assumption of Mary, the 1870 dogma of papal infallibility, the uh, dogmas uh, proclaimed by the Council of Trent against justification by faith alone, these are all dogmatic commitments that are signs of the unwillingness of the Catholic Church to go deeper in its inner renewal. The inner renewal of the Catholic Church always lies within the synthesis, but never breaks away from this at a very fundamental level. So all of us need to deal with the challenges of having a not purified response to the gospel. But we all need to be open to the transforming uh, power and action of the Holy Spirit through God's word that will enable us to move forward in our response and making it more and more or closer and closer to a yes <clears throat> alone response. Some of the common misconceptions about present-day Catholicism. This is something that we often hear. A spiritual renewal is occurring, and it is evident that this is the case. There are many movements within the Catholic Church that are showing signs of a degrees of renewal. The Catholic Church has always been the home of different renewal movements within the Catholic Church. So it's not a, only a recent phenomena, but perhaps um, in, in recent decades, this phenomena is more evident. Yes, that's true, and we should celebrate uh, at least part of what it means for some of these uh, renewal movements uh, to be impactful uh, within Catholic Church, but it is happening in all directions. The system is not renewing itself only in the, let's say, evangelical uh, direction, Bible-based, gospel-centered direction. It is a system that is renewing itself in all directions. It is a living body that is knowing a season of renewal at every level. The traditional movements wanting to go, you know, deeper into the traditional outlook of the church. There are renewal movements there, stronger growing movements. There are liberationist movements wanting, you know, the church to embrace um, um, tendencies, ideological tendencies, political influences, closer to uh, the cries, the needs of the poor and implementing reforms that would transform the church into a more democratic, horizontal type of structure. There are folk religion movements wanting to uh, reinforce the commitment of the church to folk religion, folk practices, spiritual uh, disciplines uh, shaped by uh, folk religion. There Marian movements are on the rise. They are renewing Marian practices, Marian traditions, and Marian devotions. There is a charismatic movement that is only one 
of many renewal movements within the Catholic Church. So spiritual renewing is occurring, but we need to be aware that this renewal is taking place across the board of Catholicism. The system is renewing itself in all directions. And so uh, this is not to be taken as a one-sided positive uh, observation, but the system is expanding in all of its components, absorbing all kinds of trends without losing its basic outlook and its universal scope. There is a common creedal basis. That's another uh, often repeated um, comment, and that is, of course, true. The Nicene, the Trinitarian Christological heritage of the early church is our common basis, and this is, of course, true. Yet, we have to think about a distinction bet between what is formally true and what is practically the case. There are some fundamental breaches in the doctrine of Christ, not only as far as some peripheral elements of the faith are concerned. The whole Catholic inflated ecclesiology is fueled by a Christological understanding of the Church being the prolongation of the Incarnation. The whole Mariological uh, body of doctrines is largely dependent on a Christological breach and making that Christological consensus formally true and yet at the same time practically problematic. The doctrine of revelation, we of course, we agree that Christ is the revelation of God, but for the way the Catholic Church understands it, means that the living voice of Christ can be heard in the ongoing present day magisterium of the Church. And so making that common confession something that formally can be recognized, but needs to be understood more deeply and seen in its problematic outcomes. Salvation, of course, we, we, we all agree uh, uh, along the lines of the um, Apostles' Creed and the uh, early heritage of the Church, but the way in which it is then worked out, Catholic soteriology is worked out, shows that there are significant degrees of uh, problematic problems in the way in which basic understandings of Christ, the Church, the work of Christ are apprehended and worked out in terms of their soteriological uh, dimensions. So it can be argued that the common base is in, at, at times more superficial than real. And the, the basic doctrinal uh, system is committed to different poles, not the yes only attempt to respond faithfully to the gospel, but the yes and no attempt to include, absorb, integrate yes and no elements to that response. Another important uh, distinction that is often heard is that we deal with individual Catholics. This is especially true for you know, missionary practitioners. We're not dealing with the institution, we're dealing with individual people, and that is true. Uh, not every Catholic is fully aware of or, or where, where the church stands and what the church believes. There are degrees of appropri appropriation of Catholic belief and practice within Catholicism. There are different Catholics, different way, different types of Catholics, different ways of uh, Catholics to be Catholics. And yet, uh, the Roman Catholic institution is always involved because the Catholic faith is always social, sacramental, and linked to its full theological vision. There may be people who are not as coherent with the whole of the Catholic teaching. But because of the nature of the Catholic faith, that is always social, never individualistic, always sacramental, 
the relationship between the individual and the institution cannot be simply overlooked. And of course, there are different ways of approaching different people and appreciating the fact that all, not all Catholics are fully aware of the whole of the Catholic uh, theological system, but at the same time, uh, believing that individuals are isolated atoms detached from the overall picture is another simplistic type of understanding. So, as you think about it, let me conclude this um, first session by looking at the two biblical paradigms whereby we can approach Catholicism. And um, I'm not you know, saying that one is over against the other, but I think that the way in which we approach Catholicism lies behind these two paradigms. On the one hand, Galatians 1, where Paul deals with uh, a kind of teaching that was taught in, um, in the Galatian churches. And even though it seemed to be close to the gospel, even though it was morally motivated and it had a certain extent of overlap with the biblical gospel, Paul comes to the point of saying, this is an other gospel. Similar language, overlapping concerns, points of convergence as far as the basic understanding of theism, Judaic theism, and an appreciation of the person and work of Christ, but at some fundamental points so different that Paul is enabled and entitled to say this is another gospel. Or the Philippians 1 paradigm, where Paul is dealing with people uh, around him, uh, criticizing him, blaming him, slandering him, and yet Paul recognizes that they preach Christ. And if they do so, he rejoices for it. So he is aware of these two main, let's say, frameworks on how to deal with people who are outside closed circles of friendship and ecclesiastical um, belonging, one paradigm recognizes that in spite of some similarities, there are differences that make it possible to say that it's a different gospel, or in spite of the fact that there, are, there have been misunderstandings, that there have been painful events, that there are caricatures that go, go on, yet the preaching of the gospel is the same. And so it's a reason to rejoice. I think Catholicism needs to be approached uh, in uh, one or the other, or maybe that's the exact, the exact question that we have in our mind. How do, do we have to approach it biblically? Is it a Galatians 1? Uh, situation, or is it a Philippians 1 situation?